So I came to the United States in 1987. Oh, God. I mean, the lights, I can't see any of you. It's like, it's just, it's just a black abyss that I'm looking at, which is appropriate for this talk, but anyway. <laughs> You're not going to laugh much, believe me. Um, Anyway, I came in 1987 to the United States. It was towards the end of the Reagan administration. And looking back on it today, there's a real sense in which it was a different America. There was a real sense of optimism about the future, about what America was capable of doing, what Americans could achieve. There was a real sense of America's impact, a positive impact on the world. There was real differences or some differences between the political parties. And again, I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture because we know it wasn't great, but it's just so different than the way it is today. You know, in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And there was a real sense that America won and that the future was America's. And that our way of thinking, our way of life, our political uh, you know, views, our political system was the system of the future. The internet started up, I mean, those of you who were around back then, it was exciting, it was fun. You know, playing around with those first browsers and seeing what was possible. there was a real sense that the American sense of life was alive, was real. Now, whether it was or wasn't, that's the sense that you got, I think, during that period of the 1990s. And just, just to remind everybody, because I know that people here have various um, you know, levels of engagement with Ayn Rand's ideas, what do we mean by a sense of life? And I'm going to give you a quote from Ayn Rand, and I'll try to explain. A sense of life is a preconceptual equivalent of metaphysics, an emotional, subconsciously integrated appraisal of man and of existence. It sets the nature of man's emotional responses and the essence of his character. And you, you, get, this, you get a sense of somebody's sense of life in the way they respond to art, in the way they respond to other people. It's this automated response, it's this emotional response you have to your values or to disvalues. It's the way you kind of live your life, that sense with which you live your life. And a culture too can have a sense of life, Rand teaches us. She says a culture like an individual has a sense of life, or rather the equivalent of a sense of life. An emotional atmosphere created by its dominant philosophy by its view of man and of existence, by its, uh, this emotional atmosphere represents a culture's dominant values and serves as a leitmotif of a given era, setting its trends and styles. And America has had a sense of life of the Enlightenment, a sense of life with the idea that progress is possible and progress is good, that science is a value, that technology is exciting, that self-reliance is something important and possible. Reality is knowable, success, wealth, happiness are possible. Other men are not my enemies. They are of value. And behind all this, a real sense of a love of America, a real sense that this country is exceptional, it is special, it is unique, and that it is strong and it is good. I think that is the essence of the American sense of life. It's what it really means. It's again held unconsciously. It's not a conscious set of ideas. And it's always in tension between these ideas of enlightenment and the dominant philosophy in our schools, at our universities, in our culture, which is the opposite of the enlightenment, which rejects reason, individualism, capitalism. Rand talked about the fact that if we are going to survive, if we're going to be successful, in spite of the bad philosophy that exists out there, it is our sense of life 
we are going to be relying on, at least until better ideas catch up. Now project to today. What do we see in the world around us in terms of the politics of the day, in terms of the people and how they approach these various issues? Well, what we see is tribalism instead of individualism. People doing, following the crowd, doing what they've expected, judging based on which tribe you belong to, which political party you're associated with. We see this in cancel culture, cancel culture both of left and on the right. And if you don't believe there's cancel culture on the right, ask me in the Q&A. There's a great example just from this last weekend. Our culture seems dominated by fear. Fear of immigration, that's a big one, right? Americans seem to be most concerned about immigrants. We're afraid of them. And if you want to know what I think of that, ask me in the Q&A. But it's not just immigrants, right? We're afraid of AI. ChatGPT is going to kill us all. It hallucinates, and one day it'll hallucinate. I don't know. I'm, let's not go into it. But it's going to kill us all. And, and these are people who are working on ChatGPT. These are people in tech. These are the people who used to be the most optimistic, positive people in our culture are now telling us we're all going to die. And recently there was a guy who went and gave a talk at the university, and he said, I'm so glad I'm 76 years old because I will die of natural causes. You guys are all going to be killed by AI. He told the students. And you're serious. And this is one of the giants of computer science. This is not some, you know, nobody. We're afraid of the climate, Greta has told us. I'm not sure we should be alive right now, according to Greta. I think we've already died. And it's just, it just permeates. Fear permeates. Darkness, pessimism. It's all going to end soon. I mean, again, if you... If you I, I did this, you know, because... They pay me to give talks, so I actually do research. I, I listened to one of Donald Trump's uh, uh, rallies, one in Arizona recently, and it's just filled with fear. I mean, we're finished. We're dead. For all the wrong reasons, because we might be finished, but for all the wrong reasons. And it's not just fear. It's, it's hatred and resentment of the other. Right? If I said the American sense of life always was about viewing other people as a value, as a, as a, a potential trader, now it's, oh. You know, I first noticed this uh, in an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Ever seen Curb Your Enthusiasm? This is the first time it hit me, right? There's an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm where, um, what's his name, the, the lead character, Larry, is, uh, is given permission by his wife on their 10th anniversary to have sex with anybody he wants. And the whole season is him searching for somebody who will have sex with him. <laughs> and he finally finds somebody. And she's really good looking and he really likes her. And, they, and they're making out and he's about to fulfill this amazing fantasy. And from the corner of his eye, he sees a photograph of George Bush. <laughs> and he says, you're a Republican? And that's it, right? It's all over. I never realized that, that, you know, that politics got in the way of sex, but here we go. <laughs> There's a real suspicion of success, of wealth, of achievement, of tech, of innovation, of big tech. That now sounds like a really scary thing. Big tech. A real skepticism of science and the scientists, of experts, of so-called authorities. And we have come close to, not close, we have also experienced real violence, political violence, whether it's BLM or January 6th. It's a different world. Gone is the optimism, gone is the excitement, gone is the confidence. Today, much more likely to see people who resent America, or at best, think America is great not because of its ideas, not because of its founding, not because of its political system, but because, I don't know, to quote Tucker Carlson, well, not exact quote, but to paraphrase Tucker Carlson, because we have great scenery and we believe in God. 
which he did a whole episode of, This is Why America is Great. There's no sense of what is American exceptionalism. There's a rejection of it. What did Trump say in an interview when he was told about Putin kid killing journalists? All countries kill people. We kill people too. Big deal. We're just like everybody else. And that's not good. Right? So, American sense of life is at best on life support. At worst, it's gone. And that should trouble us. Because Ayn Rand and Leonard Peikoff have told us what comes next. We'll get to that. But what I want to do now is really think about how we got here. And, you know, we could, you know, deep dive into ideas that caused this, into the philosophy that has brought us here. And I think, I think all, everybody here knows where we go from there. You know, anti-reason, anti-individualism, anti-capitalism. It's inevitable that they grind away at the sense of life that is America. But there's a particular way, particular sequence of events that I believe has uh, happened over the last 25 years that have led us to this. The ideas have been around for 100 years. The same anti-American ideas have been around for 100 years. But over the last 25 years, certain things have happened in America that have led us to question everything we believe about this country and about ourselves. And I'm going to start where I think it starts, because there was that optimism going in to the 21st century. And then 9-11 happened. And I don't know how many of you remember that day. I think it's hard to forget if you were an adult during that period of time. But it was incomprehensible. America was attacked. New York was attacked. The Twin Towers, the Pentagon. The bastions, in a sense, the symbols of American capitalism, the symbols of American defense, were destroyed. Many Americans died, and many, many more could have. And that was a shock. And for a while, Americans rallied. They rallied around the flag. They rallied with the idea, okay, we'll come together. We can defeat this. We can do it. We are the greatest country ever. We can achieve something. And what happened was one of the great betrayals of history. A political class, our intellectual class, betrayed the American people. They lied to us. Remember, Islam is a religion of peace, hijacked by, uh, I don't know, some crazies. George Bush, just a month after 9-11. We were told we, you know, we were going to go to Afghanistan and destroy this enemy. It's 20 years, 23 years later, the enemy is back running Afghanistan. We did nothing. Couldn't kill bin Laden, couldn't kill the Taliban, couldn't destroy anybody. Then we went to Iraq. Nobody knows exactly why. Nobody ever explained to us why. And the lies just piled up. And our intellectuals supported our politicians but nobody called them on it. No, if you don't identify the enemy, if you can't call the enemy by its name, how can you win? How can you defeat an enemy that you're afraid, literally afraid, to actually name? They lied. But what is even more egregious and more evil is they demanded real sacrifices in the name of those lies. Sacrifices of troops, sacrifices of wealth. The thousands of kids who died on the fields of Afghanistan and Iraq, for what? For what? They believed, I really do think, they believed they were fighting for an America that was worthy. But their leaders didn't. Their leaders lied to them. Their leaders had no strategy, had no idea what was going on. It was a, an amazing uh, uh, story, came out about three or four years ago in the Washington Post, got no attention, which was one of the shocking things, and it documented in detail what the generals and the politicians actually thought about Afghanistan. 
as compared to what they told us about Afghanistan and just how blatantly they were lying about the mission, about its success, about the prospects, about what they believed could happen. And it is indicative that it's a story that kind of disappeared, that nobody really, it should have been the biggest story of the decade, and nobody cared. It didn't matter. Now, what the Americans, I think, have concluded, and concluded with some good reason, is that America is not as powerful as we thought it was. It cannot win a war. It hasn't in a very long time. Our enemies are much stronger than we think they are because we, the mightiest military force out there, cannot defeat them. They also concluded that our leaders are bigger liars than they thought they were before, that they are not to be trusted. Even our generals are really not to be trusted. And of course, the suspicion and skepticism of our intellectual elites only grew. It changed the mood, if you will, of the culture. It changed our views and it put us all in the sense of real betrayal. America was betrayed by its leaders. America was betrayed by its intellectuals in a time of real need, in a time where there was a real threat. And, and, and that threat, everybody kind of realizes, particularly right now, is still out there. It hasn't gone away. And we're still not dealing with it. We still got our head deep in the sand somewhere. Ignoring, evading what is actually happening. And as, of course, 9-11 plays out, the wars play out, and we go further into the 21st century, the next challenge happens. And that is the financial crisis. Again, I don't know how many of you remember this, but this is a major economic crisis. There was a period there in the summer where people really had a sense that their US economy was going to completely collapse. And there was a sense, too, I think completely justified, that our leaders had no idea what was going on and had no idea what to do and were generally panicked. They bail out this, they bail out that, they bail out there. Oh, they don't bail out Lehman. Why? Nobody knows. Then they bail out somebody else. Everything's just frantic. And then, you know, Paulson wants a $700 billion pool of money that he says in the bill, it actually is written, he can use at his discretion in order to save the economy. Now, Congress didn't let that pass. They gave him $700 billion with a little bit more constraints. But still, we bailed out everybody. The banks, the big banks, the investment banks, we bailed out, the auto companies, and pretty much anybody who wanted money from the Fed came to the Fed and got it, including foreign companies, not even Amer just Americans. If Bush, in his famous words, says, quote, I've abandoned free market principles to save the free market system. Now again, what is an American supposed to think of this? All the intellectuals, the economists, everybody on TV is telling the American people that the cause of this crisis is capitalism. The cause of this crisis are free markets. That indeed the American economic system has failed and that the only solution, the only way out is more statism. The only way out is more regulation. The only way out is basically semi-nationalization of the banks and auto companies and all the rest. That's the only way to deal with this crisis. And there was almost, I was, I was doing TV in those days. There was almost no voice that said, wait a minute, slow down. This isn't capitalism. This isn't what happened. Here's what happened. There was just nobody out there. So now you place doubts in the American mind about America's military strength and its capabilities and its ability to project power across the world and its righteousness and its virtue. And now you've got a whole set of doubts about America's economic success, about capitalism, about free markets, even with the, you know, mild, you know, the, the, the very limited understanding that people have of what free markets are. There's still some respect for them. And that respect is disappearing because now it's all blown up. And the only way 
is bailouts. And really, the only way, particularly if you're sitting in 2008 and you look around the world, the only way, the only real solution long term is maybe, maybe the American model is not ideal. Maybe it's China. Maybe the Chinese model is better. They didn't seem to have as big of a financial crisis as we did. And, you know, they, 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 they have no problem nationalizing and bailing out and no problem with industrial planning and all the rest. Maybe we should mimic them. And again, think about the intellectuals and the political elite. No, not questioning any of this. Reinforcing it, repeating it, further and further, on and on. America is a failure. America is no good. To the extent that maybe China's better. The consequence, I think, was you could say maybe the last um, pathetic gasp of the American sense of life. And I would say that was the Tea Party movement. I mean, the Tea Party movement was exciting. It was emotional. It was pro-American. It was the idea of limited government. It was pro-capitalist, or at least seemed that way. It said the right words. But it was also confused and fearful and had no intellectual grounding and no understanding of what they were really fighting for or against. It was a movement that wanted to limit government, but not too much. Wanted capitalism, but not too much. Wanted to return to the founding fathers, but they didn't really know what they stood for, what they were. It was an emotional movement rather than an ideological movement. And it just led to frustration. In the end, it led nowhere. They voted, and they got a bunch of senators and congressmen who are Tea Party senators and Tea Party congressmen you think would stand up for the Constitution and stand for limited government and stand up for at least some semblance of capitalism. But they all folded very quickly and became just your know, regular politicians. If I named them today, you would say, no, those are just regular Republicans. Nothing special about them. And the movement saw that. The Tea Party movement saw that. They, they, they voted these people. They did very well in the 2010 election. And yet nothing changed. Obamacare was not repealed. Nothing happened. And, you know, so it kind of died out slowly. But the frustration, and it was really driven by fear. That Obama really brought out fear in these people. Resentment. As, as he should have, right? Obama was really bad. I mean, he seems now like... But he was really bad. At the time, I said he was the first, and I still hold to this, he was the first anti-American president. First president who didn't see American as exceptional, who didn't think America was special at all. He wanted explicitly to make America like Europe. He didn't even pretend otherwise. Again, he looks pretty good these days. And is this resentment and this fear and this giving up and not knowing what was going on and I think that ultimately led Trump to the success that he achieved in 2016. He got it. I mean, you've got to give him credit for this. He understood what was driving America at that point in time. He understood, not in these words, of course, that the American sense of life, that idea of progress and optimism and positivity about the future, that was gone. That didn't exist. He understood that what was really rampant out there was fear, some hatred, resentment. I mean, this is a man who in the lead-up to his declaration, declaring himself as running for president, this is a man who was part of the conspiracy theory about Obama's birth certificate. Remember that? Vaguely, right? And he saw the energy that that produced. People got excited about that. They hated so much that they were willing to go on some crazy conspiracy theory just in order to vindicate that hatred. And he ran a brilliant campaign. A brilliant campaign for a third world aspiring dictator. 
And the shocking thing is, the shocking thing is that it worked. I mean, he did what every dictator does. One, he told you the world was horrible, that you're justified in being afraid, that you're justified in your hatred, that it was terrible, carnage in the streets of America. We were losing on every front, economic, military, and crime, and immigrants, and everything was bad in America, literally. Carnage in the streets of America in 2016, one of the most peaceful, crime-free periods in all of American history. Literally, you see the graphs. Doesn't matter. He fed that fear, that resentment. And by the way, this horror of America is not your fault. You are good Americans. You are good people. It's not your fault. It's those others. And the others could be fill in the blank, right? It's the Chinese, it's immigrants again, always immigrants, great to blame them. And it's the elites, it's not you. And how are we gonna deal with this? What are we gonna do? What's gonna be the program to bring back America, to make it great again? What's the program? What are we actually going to do? Trust me, don't worry about it. Just vote for me, I'll take care of it. That was it. I'll solve your problems. I'll make the others pay. And Americans went for it. Americans went for it, for an America first agenda without America. With no idea what America is, what America stands for. I mean, Ayn Rand warned us of an anti-conceptual mentality. Well, here we had it. I mean, if there's ever a symbol of an anti-conceptual mentality, it is. Donald Trump. Uninterested in truth. It's not that he lies. Everybody lies in politics. It's that he doesn't care that he lies. He doesn't care what the truth is. It's irrelevant to him. What matters is success in some way, and he'll say and do whatever it takes. Complete amorality, no concern for morality one way or the other. Um, it, you know, we could spend hours, I could spend hours telling you all the bad things about Trump, but I won't do that to you. But let's speed up a little bit to the third, third key kind of existential event that I think really changed America even further, moved it even further away from the American sense of life and this is during Trump's presidency, and that is COVID. I mean, COVID, God. I mean, the incompetence. I mean, American politicians and the military, in my view, were incompetent after 9-11, no question. American economic, whatever, czars and federal reserve chairman and economists were incompetent during the financial crisis. And there's some... You know, you can explain that. There's a certain complexity to both crises. But COVID? I mean, incompetence is on a whole new level. For months, at least a couple of months, heads were buried deep, deep, deep in the sand. Nothing is happening. Everything is fine. It'll go away by itself. The CDC, remember the test that failed and everything on the CDC sidelined. And it's just a whole string of just absurdities which led to panic, which led to lockdowns, which then continued for a couple of years. And of course, what you really saw during this period is how America really divided into tribes. More than any other event, this event really concretized this idea of tribalism. I mean, whether you were for or against masks had nothing to do with science had nothing to do with your age, had anything to do with, you know, pre-existing conditions, had everything to do with which tribe you belong to. One tribe was all four masks, and I think they still wear them, some of them, and some, one tribe was, no, never, we never wear masks. Same about vaccines, the same about ivermectin, the same about, I think, drinking Clorox, or what was it, something like that. Although if they actually drunk the Clorox, then one tribe would actually shrink more than the other. Um, I mean, the 
this is a real example of tribalism, in, in, it, which was mind-boggling. I mean, as <laughs> negative as I thought things were before COVID, COVID made things so real in terms of how far America had sunk. And, you know, then, of course, on top of that, the la that last remnant of American, uh, American sense of life, that idea that we, we still admire success and we still admire science, we still admire technology, that went out the window. Science now was political, completely. And people divided themselves up, again, politically in terms of their respect or disrespect for science. And of course, the tribalism leads one to be suspicious and hateful of your neighbor. But that was elevated. That became much worse. And to top it all off, we got BLM riots, burning down of whole neighborhoods, and the, just the incompetence of our police and our political class to deal with that and to know what to do. I think the consequence or the conclusion of all this is just an erosion steady over the last 24 years, a constant steady erosion in whatever was left of the American sense of life, of this view, this positive view of the future, positive view of technology, positive view of science, positive view of America. And without a sense of life, without a sense of life, where do we go? Well, without a sense of life, there's nothing to keep America from just being another country out there. And just being another country out there means that, you know, when the right crisis comes around, when the right leader comes around, when the right circumstances comes around, we could easily abandon the freedom and the American political system that we still barely have. We've seen with the rise of this culture of fear and distrust, banding reason, elevation of emotion, you know, entrenched tribalism. And the question now is, where does this, where does the next, what does the next crisis trigger? Where do we go from here? How bad could it get? You know, Lenin Peikoff, in two of his important books, Ominous Parallels and the Dim Hypothesis, gives us a roadmap. It's not a roadmap that is one that, you know, anybody's eager to embrace, but it is there. It's a roadmap of what happens. Once you give up on that sense of America, what is holding back America from becoming a dictatorship? And it's weird for me to even say that, right? Dictatorship? What are you talking about, Yvonne? But where else do we go from here? Given the ideas, and it's not like there's some wave of better ideas that are just swarming over us, and it's just a matter of, in a few, in a few years, things will turn around. No, the ideas just seem to be getting worse. I think about the ideas out there. I mean, on the left, I guess, I guess you, could, you could say that the ideas on the left can't get worse. I think that's right. I think they've hit a dead end. I mean, basically, the ideologues of the left are on campuses. I think there's a college here at California that this weekend, they've occupied the building, and they've, ta they've actually taken faculty and the president of the university hostage. They're not just viewing their support of Hamas as theoretical. Now they're into taking hostages. I mean, how do, you, how do you get lower or worse than the kind of nihilism that celebrates murder, rape, and torture? H how do you get worse than that? I don't think you can. I mean, literally, that is what is going on in American campuses, is a celebration of murder, rape, and torture a celebration of one of the ugliest, most horrific, most violent, most murderous groups and ideologies in human history. 
And by the way, in a kind of an interesting irony, the same, the same right, people who attacked us on 9-11 from an ideological perspective, the same. Since we didn't identify them back then, we can't see it today, but it's the same people. Hamas, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they're all the same. Now, we don't resent them. We don't want to fight them. Oh, no, we want to join them. We want to hand them the keys. At least a minority, but still a very vocal and very large minority of the left want to do that. So there's a sense in which it's very hard to go beyond nihilism. Nihilism's it. It's a dead end. And that's what DEI is, and that's what ESG is, and that's what the environmentalist movement has become, and that's what this adoration for Hamas is. It's just nihilism. There's no program. There's no goal. There's nothing to fight for except the destruction of America, except the destruction of the West, the destruction of freedom. That's all they want. They're not, you know, every time there's a new technology that maybe could cool the planet, we put some stuff in the atmosphere or something, some cool new thing coming out of one of the universities, what immediately happens? Demonstrations, they shut it down. We don't want to cool the planet. We want to stop industry. We want to stop progress. We want to stop growth. There's a degrowth movement. They call themselves degrowth. So they are naked now in terms of what they want. If you remember the whole discussion of anti-racism, which is basically racism, just from the other side, I guess. And this, for what purpose? To bring everybody down. There's no more evil and there's no more dead-ended ideology than egalitarianism. It goes nowhere. And it's only about the destruction of the able. It's only about destruction and death. The left has no way to go. They have fear, no solutions, dead ends. They, you know, they could return to their old liberalism, but nobody's interested. There's no passion around that. That's not exciting. I mean, you want to be like Joe Biden? Nobody wants that. The excitement, the energy is around these nuts, crazies, these nihilists. And, you know, you could say the good thing is, and it is a good thing, that it's clear that this is not what Americans want. It's clear that this Americans mostly reject. Every time these crazy left agenda is on the ballot in some way or another, even in places like San Francisco, it's turned down, it's voted against, people reject it. And, you know, there's a slow winding away from the crazy nihilism, with the exception of Hamas, that's still going strong. But there's no alternative. There's nothing that's being offered. They're moving away from it. But where do we go ideologically? And I don't think there's any way to go on the left ideologically. I think we're done. Whatever innovations are going to have to come and will come, I think, from the right. And here again, old-time conservatism seems dead. It's marginalized. It's anti-Trump. Or it's pro-Trump, but it's marginalized. It's, again, you know, there's no Goldwater, there's no Reagan, there's no energy behind America, behind free markets, behind anything American that we would identify. There is Trump's populism, but Trump's populism is not a governing ideology. It's about Trump. It's a personality worship. There's no way for that to become a political movement because there's no political agenda. There are no ideas. Somebody's going to have to fill in this ideological vacuum that exists in America today. And there are plenty of candidates. There are plenty of candidates. And the main candidate is, what is the one way in which we can relieve fear? We can gain confidence. We can return to our Western tradition. What is the one thing being offered today that even some former atheists are attracted to? Well, it's religion. You know, if only you believe in God, you won't be so fearful. 
If only believe in American destiny, guided by God, America will be great again and everything will be fine. Just talk to some of these former atheists or semi-atheists, or what do they call themselves now? Cultural Christians. They're still atheists, but they're cultural Christians. And there's a bunch of competition on the right for who's going to carry this flag forward. They are national conservatives. A lot of intellectuals, lots of conferences. They do a lot of work, and they're going to be well embedded in a Republican administration of the future. But they're the moderates. The next step is trad cons. These are the Catholics who really kind of are really getting close now to a theocracy. Not quite, but close. And don't believe in an American ideals and American constitution. And then <laughs> there's a book that came out two years ago called The Case for Christian Nationalism. Don't recommend it. It is... Um, it's about as bad as you can imagine of a call to action. But there's a number of politicians out there calling themselves Christian nationalists. I mean, not just the complete nutcase, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who constantly calls herself that. But there are others. This is gaining steam. I mean, this is a book that calls for ethnicity shouldn't mix, heretics can be killed, violent revolution is justified, and, you know, what our nation really needs right now is a charismatic Caesar-like leader to raise the consciousness of the people and galvanize us. This is a serious book that people identify with. And we've got two senators who I think are very charismatic and very, you know, popular, and who maybe are not channeling the most crazy part of this, but certainly are expressing these ideas openly. One of them might be Trump's VP candidate, J.D. Vance, and Josh Hawley. I count them as the two most dangerous politicians in America today. So I think the right is on the rise, the ugly right. And look, when I use right-left, let's just be clear how I use it, and it's not necessarily how Ayn Rand used it, others have used it. To me today, right and left are both collectivists. They're just variations of. The left tends to be more egalitarian, the right tends to be more religious and nationalist, but they're all collectivists. We are off that chart. We are the individualists versus the collectivists. There are many forms of collectivism. Only one real form of individualism. So it's just a matter of time between the right mix of ideas, the right trigger, the right event, the right crisis happening, and the right leader, the right personality. We've seen that the American people go for personalities, that they're willing to worship a personality. So with that right combination, Sadly, there's a big chunk of the American people ready, ready for something much worse than we have today. Now, you know, <laughs> I don't want to leave you on such a depressing note. I mean, there are a lot of people out there, there's a lot of people in the world around us who don't buy into this. There's a vast commentators call vast center that is facing this Biden-Trump choice and they don't like it one bit. They'd rather not vote for either one of them. They don't really like Trump. They don't, certainly don't like, or many of them don't like Biden. And they're stuck. It's like, these are the choices. What am I supposed to do? Most Americans are not quite there, are not quite ready to take that next leap away from liberty and away from freedom. They've been prepped, they've been softened, they've been readied, but they're not quite ready. It's not going to happen quickly. They're years, maybe decades. And these are the people that have to be impacted. These are the people that have to gain 
gain not just a sense of life, but now we need ideas because you can't get a sense of life without the ideas in the background. The enlightenment in some form or another needs to be resurrected, needs to be brought back to the forefront. And in that sense, as long as there are still, I think, a majority of Americans, small majority, but a majority of Americans are still a sane, are still looking, are still unhappy with the situation as it is, as long as there's that majority, there's still hope that we can avoid the coming train wreck, we can avoid the coming dictatorship, we can avoid the coming authoritarian era. So, what do we need? Americans angry, frustrated. They know they've lost something. They know America's missing something. They don't know exactly what it is. They don't know where it went. They don't know what they're for. They have a sense of what they're against. They're against the status quo. They're against about these leaders. They don't like them, but they don't know what they're for. They're seeking a voice. They're seeking intellectual guidance. They're seeking intellectuals to step forward and provide them with a voice. Now, in the end, it could be those really, really, really bad intellectuals. The national conservatives, the Tradcons, the Christian nationalists, or somebody like that, who ultimately provides them with that voice. And sadly, in, after 9-11 and after financial crisis and certainly during COVID, it was often those kind of voices, left and right, who came and explained and articulated and brought the people along with them. But if that happens, then we're lost. We need a new direction, and the only way to have a new direction is with new intellectuals. The intellectuals today must be replaced, and there's never been more urgency to doing so. I really do think that in the decades to come, the very few decades to come, we are literally on the brink. What we need today is dozens, dozens of intellectuals, dozens of people writing and speaking and engaging and persuading and inspiring people out there in the world. We need new schools educating young kids to think, think for themselves. We need artists to concretize a new aesthetic, an aesthetic of America, of American sense of life, a positive view of the world, a positive view of reality. We need scientists who can use the objectivist epistemology. We need business leaders who make money and are proud of it. We need that sense of life through everything. You know, one of the great tragedies, I think, in the world in which we live right now is that somebody like Elon Musk, there are days in which he's fantastic. That he expresses the American sense of life so well. You know the one where um, he was asked once about Starlink, about the satellites with the internet connection. You know, uh, what are the regulators in all these other countries going to do if the internet is coming from the sky? How are they going to regulate it? And you know what his response was? They can shake their fists in the sky, to the sky. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And then other days, he's a complete tribalist and brainless. And it's just stunning. I mean, if they shake the fist to the sky, Elon Musk was consistent, we would be on our way. I'd be a lot more optimistic. But that's what we need. Business and we'll stand up. Stand up in front of Congress and tell them what they actually think of them. Or maybe not stand up in conference, but stand up, turn around, and walk out when they are confronted with these losers asking them questions about their business, which they have no business asking. People who make money and are proud of making money and say it and live it. We need all that. We need to change the world. And every year it's urgent, and it's always been urgent, but it just seems to get more and more urgent. Now, luckily, I think we're on the path. We don't yet have hundreds of intellectuals, but we now have dozens, and it's growing. 
and I think it's going to grow much faster as we move into the future. We have tools, and the internet is amazing. And now you only have one Iran, me, but soon there'll be clones. <laughs> I mean, Chad GPT, so they might hallucinate once in a while, but generally they'll be pretty good, right? We need to use whatever technology we have in order to get the ideas out there into the world. We need to provide a new, new explanations for what is going on, for what is happening. We need to engage. And we have this amazing, life-affirming philosophy. We have all the tools available to us today to take on this battle, to take on this world to take on the tribalism of left and the tribalism of right, to take on the nationalist this, nationalist that. And maybe there's still a spark, maybe there's still an element of that American sense of life still in the people out there that we can leverage, that we can connect with and bring about a real revolution, a revolution of the mind, a revolution of ideas, an American revolution. Because that's what we need. We need to bring America back to its founding revolution, to the ideas of the founding revolution. And only Ayn Rand can do that. So if, if we're going to save America, if America's going to be saved, then it's up to you. It's up to us. There's nobody else. We are the true heirs of the founders. They fought, they staked their lives, their honor, their property on that fight. We need to do the same. Thank you. Right, there's a mic there. And for the internet questions, I cannot see you, so you're going to have to... Um, Yell at me when you have an internet question. Oh, by the way, I need to tell you, I'm doing the Iran Book Show live from Ocon in an hour in the room next door. So if you haven't been depressed enough, join us and I can give you more of that. Oh, wait. Thanks for your talk. You mentioned there is an example of right-wing cancel culture. I'd be interested to hear about that. Oh, yeah. I mean... <laughs> Two stories that just came up this week out of, you know, I just, just looking in the news. One is, um, everybody you know who Dolly Parton is? You know Dolly Parton? I mean, she's an American icon, right? And um, the Federalists uh, magazine online wrote a story attacking Dolly Parton. Now, Dolly Parton is a good Christian. She, you know, she goes to church on Sundays and she does all the right things. What's the problem with Dolly Parton, according to the Federalist? And they try to rally people, Christians shouldn't like Dolly Parton, they shouldn't support Dolly Parton. Why? Because she takes this concept of love too far. She's like way too tolerant of LGBTQ people. And therefore she should be canceled. And literally in a serious magazine. You know, God has a certain view of sexuality. You can't have any other view. That's it. Cancel her. And then... Same, uh, two days later, David French, I don't know if you guys know who David French is. David French is a uh, well-known conservative intellectual, uh, used to be at the National Review, uh, you know, uh, uh, but a, a never Trumper. Somebody who very early on said, I can never vote for Trump, right? And uh, that's one sin he committed. And the second sin he committed is he adopted, a few years ago, he, he and his wife adopted a a uh, young girl from Ethiopia who's black. And over those two issues, race, the blackness of the girl they adopted, and his never Trump, he was outed, he was uh, kicked out of his church. He was basically made very unwelcome. He's very religious, and he goes to church, and he's very involved in the church, and kicked out of his church, found another church, and, you know, fine. But then he was invited, about a, a few weeks ago, he was invited to be on a panel at one of these big conferences at this church that he used to belong to about 
um, uh, the topic was, uh, you know, the fact that we can't talk to each other or, or the, you know, the, the, the political divide. And, uh, and he was going to be a panelist with three other people. And when this was made public, and a church member discovered that David French was going to be on the panel, they went apoplectic. And basically the panel was canceled, and he was canceled. Um, they will not tolerate. They will not tolerate. In a very large church, they will not tolerate somebody who's a never-Trumper and who might have adopted a black kid. Um, and it, you can read about it. It's all, you know, he's written about it. His wife has written about it. Uh, it's, it's, and, and we're talking about somebody <laughs> deeply religious, right? Somebody we don't agree with. And a conservative, always been a conservative, still is a conservative, anti-abortion, the whole thing, right? On issue by issue, that's not, that's not the problem, right? That's pure tribalism, and that's as about as cancel culture as it gets. Yaron, why is the American sense of life today uh, at greater risk, or perhaps already dead, um, compared to the last century. So uh, to recap, I think your main points, 9-11, um, financial crisis, rising Western sympathies for evil in the world, yep. Hamas or um, China, Putin's love, fe or Tucker Carlson's love fest for Putin. Why is that worse today? Why is our position worse today compared to World War I, Spanish flu, uh, the Great Depression, and then World War II. So why wouldn't, yeah, to put it another way, sure. why wouldn't an Iranian first strike on American soil, because they're about to get nukes, why, would that, why wouldn't that fix things today compared to Pearl Harbor? Uh, so Is it just that we don't have a concrete enemy for no, the it's, collectivists it's not, and tribalists? It's not fight? an issue of the enemy. Look, it's a hundred additional years of bad ideas. It's the grinding away of people's confidence in their ability to reason, ability to think, ability to understand the world. It is a hundred additional years of altruism digging deeper and deeper into the, the, the American soul. It is a, a, a you know, constant flood of these, of, of, you know, of, whether it's postmodernism or whether it's uh, the different variations of, it just undermines the Enlightenment ideas that made the original American sense of life possible. The Enlightenment intellectually is dead. And what you're left with is the anti, you know, reality, reason, egoism, and capitalism. And, you know, ideas take a long time in a good culture to actually chip away and erode and eliminate. And they need, my point is they need this external help, right? These crises bring out the worst. And that just accelerates the decline. But the decline was happening. These events, 9-11, uh, financial crisis, COVID, just accelerated the process because they brought to the forefront a weakness, the failure of intellectuals to understand the world or to, or, or, or to have answers to any of the questions people have. And they erode that sense of life. Remember, we won World War II. You know, the world would be different if we'd lost it. We didn't win 9-11. We didn't win anything around that period. Uh, but yes, the Great Depression was a huge blow to America, and that was a huge blow relative to the 19th century. Ayn Rand always said that you can't really understand what the 19th century sense of life was like unless you'd lived it, unless you'd experienced it to some extent. So, yeah, already by the 30s and 40s, it wasn't the same as it was in the, 19, in the uh, 1870s, 1880s. It wasn't. World War I definitely had its effect, and again, the ideas are there. But there was still something. Obviously, Ayn Rand saw something in Americans, something in the sense of life that she believed would save us from authoritarianism, would save us from dictatorship. And what I'm saying is, that now is eroded, so I'm not sure that'll save us from dictatorship and save us from authoritarianism, or for how long we can hold out for that. In, in what way does the American sense of life characterize or impact science and technology? Well, it impacts our attitude towards science and technology. 
So one of the things that characterized the American sense of life was excitement about innovation, excitement about new products, excitement about new technology and, and new scientific discoveries. I mean, manifest, I think, in, in, in the attitude of Americans towards the Apollo project, the, the attitude towards, of Americans towards industry and new products and you know, what, what the left calls consumerism, our, 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 our eagerness to, to buy the new and the exciting. But also just a respect for scientists and admiration for science. And as, as respect for reason, as, as uh, a, a, a belief in the, the, you know, that reason is actually you know, competent, the, the reason is efficacious, what you see is a declining respect for science itself. And what you see today in the suspicion towards AI uh, and, and, and just a certain resentment towards tech, towards big tech, uh, a, a growing resentment and suspicion towards uh, biotech. Again, not from everybody, but biotech and life extension, there's a lot of negativity out there about these things. And I think that's the reflection of this sense of life. Thank you. Hello, Ocon. Uh, my question is, you mentioned during the, um, the speech that there's a growing right-wing appreciation for uh, or desire for a new dictator in a cesarean fashion to take over the United States. Um, there's also been a growing number of cartoons and memes depicting similarities between Baron Trump and Julius Caesar. Do you think we should be looking at potential right-wing figures that could be a danger to take over the United States in the next couple generations, or is that not uh, a concern at the moment? No, I do think we should be worried about right-wing figures aspiring to do that, and, and who knows what consequences that has in America uh, and, and how it manifests itself. I gave you two names which scare me, J.D. Vance and, and, and Josh Hawley. Uh, but they're not the only ones, and, and maybe it's, it's not their generation, maybe it's a generation after them, although they're pretty young. Uh, it, it, I really do think it's something we need to watch, and it's something we need to worry about, and, and something uh, we should be concerned about. Uh, and <laughs> I was listening to the rally, to Trump's rally, right, uh, in Arizona, and you know, you, you know one of his points, um, he, he mentioned his admiration for China on this one issue. What was the issue he admires China for? He admires them for their swift trials and execution of drug dealers, right? They do it very fast. They try them quickly, and they kill them quickly. And this is something he admires, and what we need is a death penalty for drug dealers in the United States, and I assume swift trials as well. Now that's, okay, drug dealers. Nobody likes drug dealers, but really? And, and this is, again, he's talking admirably of China. So... I don't think we're quite ready for that, but this, I mean, we're going to vote for him. He, he might win. He's probably going to win. So this is the direction things seem to be moving in. Thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, American supporters of Hamas. <laughs> I observe that many of them seem openly nihilistic in a way that is consistent with how you describe them in your talk. There's a subset. I don't know how small a minority, uh, but they really lean into the term anti-colonialism, and they sort of portray themselves as the true defenders of national sovereignty and self-determination, which is a position I find incoherent, but I wonder how you would make that incoherence explicit. Uh, I mean, you have to understand what they mean by anti-colonialism, right? And there's a whole ideology, there's a whole, I mean, people have written books on this and, and everything, and it, it, it really is, I mean, America is a colonial country, right? We're colonizing from the Indians who were here before us. So anti-colonialism means America needs to disappear. Um, so it, it is explicitly nihilistic in a sense that it's explicitly anti-Western. It's explicitly anti-civilization. You know, they, they view um, McDonald's as a form of colonial, colo colonizing the rest of the world, right? Because there's McDonald's, other countries. They want all that, anything Western to be to, to go, to disappear. And that, you know, Western civilization is the good civilization in the world. It's it, that's it, right? And to the extent that that's rolled in, everybody suffers, and to the extent that's rolled in, extent that that disappears, the world is dead. I mean, it doesn't get more nihilistic than wanting to destroy 
the West and its impact on the world. The West's impact on the world is unequivocally, overwhelmingly positive. And to view it otherwise is, you know, is, is nihilistic. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Brooks. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, you spoke about the roles, you spoke about Islam and Christianity, and I'm curious to know, as an Israeli-born American and objectivist, what is your uh, view on the role that Judaism plays, if any, on the world, on America, perhaps on the future? The role Judaism plays on America, I think, is very minor. As an ideology, as a religion, I think it has very little impact on the world. Uh, Jews are obviously very, very successful. People who self-identify as Jews are incredibly successful in America. They've done very, very well as scientists, as uh, professors, as, you know, many of them, unfortunately, are crazy leftist intellectuals. Not all of them. Some of them are, you know, some of them uh, are here. Right? So it's, it's uh, maybe not self-identified, but origins of. Um, so, you know, in terms of America, I think Judaism has had very little impact as an ideology or as a religion. I think on the world, um, I think the world has had an impact on Jews more than Jews have had an impact on the world in that sense, right? Uh, again, the ideology itself has not had a big impact. Y you know... It had maybe a, 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 a positive impact a thousand years ago when uh, they kept alive some, some of their Greek thoughts and thinking together with the Arabs and helped bring it uh, to the West. The only place where Judaism has a, a, a real impact and a real role is Israel. And um, for the most part, it's a negative role, just like religion plays everywhere else. Right? It's, it's uh, the, the, the people in Israel who are most irrational, who, well, maybe not most, but are irrational, uh, who, who advocate for, for bad ideas and who make, I think, governing Israel and even Israel being successful and, and, and so on difficult are, you know, the religionists in Israel. So uh, I think that's the only place qua religion that it has any kind of impact in the world out there. And, it, and it's negative, just like religion has a negative impact everywhere that it, it, it touches. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, my question relates to your view on immigration, especially in the context of a Sunday European Parliament election, where many parties which were anti-immigration, conservative, religious and so on, um, got a lot of votes. So would you say that the context of Europe, European Union, and America is essentially the same in regard to immigration, and we, there should be the same policies in terms of striving for open borders? Or maybe would you say that in certain contexts, um, certain closed border policies could be justified? No, so thank you for asking that. I've got a note here to say, ask me about Europe, and the second one is asking me about Millet, so hopefully somebody's gonna ask me about Millet. But uh, in terms of Europe, no, I don't. I, I, I think uh, Europe is different in terms of immigration. Um, and I know people don't like to think in terms of different. You either for open immigration 100% or, or not, and that you know there's no nuance. Um, so first, let's say the latest European elections are very eye-opening. It's clear that Europe is moving in the direction of a kind of an authoritarian right, an authoritarian right that is pretending not to be so authoritarian. Marie Le Pen has gone through a real transformation. She's now a defender of, uh, of freedom. Um, if you believe that, I've got a bridge. Uh, but, you know, Europe is buying into these kind of right-wing ideologies that, that emphasize religion and, and to some extent, but nationalism. But the big issue in America and the big issue in Europe is immigration. And I think they're very different. Or well, not very different, but they're different. Uh, I want to say something about uh, the immigration in the US first. If you listen to one of these rallies of Trump, the thing that gets people most excited, the thing that gets them cheering and is his anti-immigration stance. He keeps returning for it because he loves that response from the audience. So this is the issue. When Americans are asked, what's the number one concern you have in the world today? It's not Hamas. 
It's not Iran, it's not Russia, it's not China, it's not the economy, it's not debt, it's, it's immigration. People are afraid of immigrants. And it's stunning, right? Why are they afraid of immigrants? Crime will go up. Crime's declining. You know, with the spike of the so-called invasion on the southern border, crime has come down. They're afraid because uh, they'll take their jobs. But unemployment is really, really low. Workforce participation is fairly high. And um, there are lots of unfilled jobs in the United States right now. On every factual issue, they're wrong. It doesn't matter. They hate immigrants and they're fearful of them. The difference in Europe is that a significant number, if not the overwhelming majority of immigrants are Muslim. And the challenge there goes back to 9-11. We never dealt with the problem. We never faced up to the reality of Islamism, of Islamic totalitarianism. We never faced it. We never looked it in the eye and said, this needs to be destroyed. This needs to be confronted. This ideology cannot be allowed to have political manifestation in the world out there. We never dealt with Iran. We never dealt with all the other manifestations of Islamic totalitarianism. If we had, there wouldn't be Hamas today. If we had, there wouldn't be a Hezbollah. They'd all have been destroyed after 9-11, as they should have been. And what is happening today is because this ideology is still free and it's still available and it's still thriving and it's still got state backing and it's still got organizational backing, many of the people coming into Europe still adhere to it. And there's nothing to stop them. There's nothing to confront them. So Europe really faces a real risk, a real danger, not a pretend danger that we face here from those evil Venezuelans, they face it from Islamists who really want to take over Europe, who really have that fantasy, which we didn't deal with back then. And look, the only way to deal with it is not to build walls. The only way to deal with it is to go to war with who needs to go to war, destroy them, and then invite people to come to your country. And Europe will never do that. So Europe is in a real crisis, right? It really is. And I, and, and the, the right is... is exploiting that. What they'll do about it, I don't know. But I, you know, I once made a prediction, and I'm not saying this will happen, but I once made a prediction a long time ago, this was 15 years ago, I said, you know, or, or maybe it was during the big mass migration of Muslims into Europe in 2015. Uh, it was that the, you know, the Germans are not gonna go quietly into the night as Islam takes over Europe. It's gonna be bloody. It's gonna be unpleasant. And if you see the rise of the AFD in Germany, it's already showing signs of that unpleasantness in its future. Thank you. And tell us about Millet. <laughs> <laughs> so I like Millet. Um, I, I think he's the one in, in the political world, I can't think of anybody who I have any positive views of at all, anywhere pretty much in the world right now. And Millet's a breath of fresh air. I disagree with him on a lot of things. I mean, make it clear. You know, he, he spouts this anarcho-capitalist stuff, um, but he doesn't, he, he's not governing from that perspective. He's anti-abortion, he's religious. But he seems to really take these ideas of economic liberty at least seriously. You know, when he lectures, he's giving you a lecture on economics. And he takes these, this, this idea of, of individual freedom, at least, again, from the perspective of economics, it's something that, it's, it, it's him, it's, it's genuine, it's real. He's new to these ideas, so this is still something that's developing within him. And I have to say, the thing I like, the thing that really tilted me towards him, because I'm skeptical of libertarians, um, was his foreign policy. Here's a guy who's unabashedly pro-Western, pro-American, anti-China, anti-Putin, anti-Hamas. He's pro-Israel, pro-Ukraine. He canceled the uh, order for Chinese jets and bought used F-16s instead. I'm not sure why he needs any, F any planes, but that's not the point. The point is he wants to affiliate with America. He turned down BRICS. BRICS is this alternative, uh, you know, uh, uh, combination of nations led by the Chinese and the Russians. He turned them down for membership. He said, no, no, I'm with America. 
Wow. I mean, where do you find anybody who is that explicit about their pro-Western stance? So, I mean, you know, in this world in which there's a lot of darkness uh, when it comes to politics, he is a, I think, a, sh a relatively shining light. Now, we'll see. He, you know, and, and he's had to form a coalition with a conservative, with a conservative movement within Argentina. Um, he can't get anything passed. He can't get anything done without them. They are advocating for a lot of kind of nationalist, Dra uh, military draft, things like that, that are bad. Uh, whether he succumbs to it because he has to, whether he succumbs to it because he believes in it, I don't know. But so far, I've been impressed. Again, the standards are, for me to get impressed by a politician are pretty low, <laughs> given what we have. Thank you. My question is, what do you think the state of American politics is going to be like if Trump is going to be reelected? More importantly, the relationship between the left's racism, DEI, and kind of the right's growing uh, race realism. I think on the right, they're starting to come to this point where they're, they're willing to say that, yes, minorities are uncultured and uh, they are dumber and so on and so forth, and they're willing to try to intellectually defend that position as well. What do you think the, between that relationship? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I really, I don't think in the end it matters that much who wins this election. I know that's, be, the only good outcome of this election, I said this last time, you all hated me for it, I'm going to say it again, so be it. Um, the only good outcome for this election is Trump losing in a landslide. Anything else, anything else legitimizes him as owning, controlling, dominating the Republican Party. And that means the Republican Party goes along this very scary route towards, yeah, a, towards uh, more and more kind of religion, more and more uh, nationalism, and potentially more and more racism. And of course, you've got racists on the left as well. And ultimately, look, ultimately the, the dictator of the future is going to be somebody who can rope in the left, right? Because you can't, I mean, dictators usually find a coalition across both, both sides. And how they do that, I don't know. But, you know, maybe they can add on the racists of the left. You know, race realism goes to all directions. So, I, you know, it's, it's going to be bad no matter what because he's not going to lose in a landslide. That's reality. He didn't lose last time in the landslide. He's not going to lose in the landslide. And therefore, the Republican Party is toast. The Republican Party is a nationalist, conservative, Christian, whatever party post-Trump. As long as he's there, it's nothing, right? It's zero. It's no ideas. It's whatever Trump wants it to be. But once he's gone, they're the only people left. Um, so unless there's some alternative to the Republican Party, I don't, I don't know where we go from here. Thank you. Um, I've noticed uh, amongst the more mainstream media a growing skepticism of the far left, of far left ideas. But in my own generation, Generation Z, I've noticed many people um, who, of varying degrees of extremism or uh, non-extremism, who really are fully committed to left-wing ideas. And would you say that uh, the left is on the decline in America or that it's just changing which generation it's going to live on in? I mean, again, I don't know that a lot of people agree with me, but I, I think it's on a decline. Um, and if you look at polls, what's the youngest generation now? Z, you guys? If you look at Generation Z, Generation Z is the most conservative generation at this point in their lives of any of the last few generations, right? So they're more pro-Trump. And indeed, Trump is doing very well with young people, which is... Unexpected. He didn't do well in 16, it didn't do well in 2020, but 2024 he's doing well with young people. So I think the shift is there. Again, I think there's this, um, they're so crazy, <laughs> right? This stuff is so insane. I think a lot of Americans, including young people, are going, no, no, that, that I can't, you know, I, I need to find something different. And what they find different is not that great, but at least... I think, I think they're turning away from, from this. Thank you. We'll see. Peter. Thank you for a really excellent talk, Yaron. I think um, you did a 
very good job of explaining the intellectual trend that's been going on for decades and illustrated by the concretes you chose. Um, I don't regard it as a pessimistic talk. Uh, I, you, you didn't come out and say things are hopeless. So there is hope, and, and as you say, the issue is, can we get our intellectuals out there influencing the culture? And in that regard, I wonder whether you think that the difference between uh, Trump being elected versus Biden being elected, do you see a difference there in terms of buying time? And I, I grant you that I, I think the idea of Trump being defeated in a landslide is, is not feasible. That would be ideal. But do you think that his election versus Biden's election makes a difference in terms of buying us time? I think Biden buys us just a little bit more time if he wins. Um, I think if Trump is emboldened and if that part of the Republican Party is <clears throat> emboldened, that is going to accelerate whatever it is that's, that's going to happen, whatever it is that's going to happen within... I, I fear the right, I think, long term. I mean, the left is horrible. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not suggesting otherwise, but I fear the right. And again, if, I, if you go back to ominous parallels and dim, so has Leonard for 40-something years. Um, and the... So I think that the more emboldened they are, the less time we have. So I think Trump winning just makes the horizon that much shorter. Thank you. Hi, I wanted to ask you about leadership and business. Uh, so you alluded to this. Um, it seems like increasingly business leaders and a lot of capital is concentrated in these hubs where a lot of leftist progressive ideology emerges or is popular. Yep. So where do you see like these leaders emerging that are unbashfully pro-capitalist. And then since you referenced Elon Musk, I was also wondering what your thoughts was of Steve Jobs. Thank you. Oh, well, that's, ni that's a nice way to end. I think we're close. Um, I love Steve Jobs, right? You know, uh, I, 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 I like the style. I like this confidence. I like the self-esteem. I you know, if you ask me about masculinity, I think he's a model for that in the 21st century. That confidence, the love of technology, the love of beauty. He brought to everything a love of beauty, which I have a huge amount of respect for. It turns out he was inspired by Atlas Shrugged. I, none of us knew this, but when he died, Wozniak, his partner, said that he used to read Atlas Shrugged regularly. Um, but I, I find him truly inspiring, one of the great business leaders in American history. Uh, just just as the way he interacted with the world. Now, if you know stories about him when he was young, he was a real hippie, and I mean, there's a lot of things not to like, and then if you, know, if you know why he died, he refused medical treatment. So there were a lot of bad things, but it's just the way, what he exuded on stage, I, I, I found inspirational. Where do you find business leaders? You know, I, I don't know. Um, and, and they could be anywhere. I don't think it's any particular hub. I do think the one positive, maybe it's positive, we'll see, is that the, this monopoly of the left over Silicon Valley is broken. So there was just a big fundraiser for Trump <laughs> um, in Silicon Valley, and you know, Silicon Valley survived, but maybe the, you know, there are other leaders there who are more pro-capitalist, uh, and, uh, and reject both Trump and uh, Biden. I, I expect they are. Uh, there, there's some objectivist business leaders who are going to be rising up and I think making a real impact, hopefully, on the world in the next, uh, in the next few years. But it, I, I do think at least the monopoly of the left seems to have been broken. And the question is, what now? And do we have pro-capitalist leaders you know, to fill in that gap? I don't know. We'll see. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. So my question, uh, I want to come back to Trump for a moment. So whatever the faults with RFK or Biden, I believe Trump to be, as far as I know, the first um, politician of that level of prominence in the history of US who is as explicit in attacking the principle of peaceful exchange of power, first with his at least complicit stance in January the 6th, and then like his fueling and embracing of the um, stolen election conspiracy. And I think that 
um, makes him, that alone makes him um, bigger, much bigger short-range danger to the United States and thus the world than any other candidates. Would you agree with this take or not necessarily? Yes, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, there's so much to say about Trump. And of course, this is an important point. The very fact that he did everything he could. Now, he couldn't do a lot, thankfully, because we've got a pretty robust system still, uh, to you know, reverse the election result should have been so unforgivable, so absurd, so anti-American, that he should have disappeared from the political stage completely. And to me, it's not so much what he will do, it's to me what's really distressing is that the American people chose to bring him back. Chose to bring him back. There was a primary. Americans could have, Republicans could have chosen somebody else. They chose him in spite of that, or maybe because of that. Maybe because of that. He stood up, he stood up against the uh, powers to be, he stu- you know, th- and that's what they want. They want a fighter who's willing even to fight against the principles of American governance. The, 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 the so com- and this is, again, what's scary is, is that, that people have chosen him, um, it, given what he did in, uh, after the, uh, the 2020 election, given those months. And if you remember, the days after January 6th, he was finished. I think most of us were convinced he was finished. That was, he'd never come back from that. That was, even Republicans in the Senate and the House were rejecting him. And within a, within a couple of months, and then as time went on, more and more and more and more, and now he dominates the party completely. He's just replaced everybody at the RNC. He has his family there. It's just total domination. There is nothing else. The, Trump is the Republican Party. It, shouldn't, it should be the Trump Party. That's what it's called. And that is... I don't know enough about American history to know whether once there was somebody like this, but I doubt it. I, I can't imagine there was anything like this ever in American history. It's very, very, very dangerous because I don't think he's competent enough to be a dictator. I don't think he's competent enough to actually do it, right? I don't think he's smart enough. I don't think he's competent enough, and I don't think he's organized enough. But it sets a precedent for the guy who is, for the person who is, and that is super scary. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.